Car crash cases, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse across the state of Alabama. The attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts. The attorneys with Josh Wright from the law firm of Hollis Wright and host David Lamb. Good evening and welcome in to the attorneys. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Got an exciting and interesting topic of conversation that I think really is going to hit home with a lot of folks. Would love to have you join our conversation. We really try to make it easy for you to engage with us here and pass your questions along to us. So you'll see all throughout the program ways at the bottom of the screen that you can join our conversation. And something that I always like to mention, uh, we have attorneys standing by right now to speak with you. So if at any point in the next 30 minutes, uh, you get a question you would love some legal advice on or you know someone who could use some free legal advice now's the time to let them know uh, that we have attorneys standing by from hollis right right now so take advantage of that leading our conversation here is carter clay from the firm of hollis right good to see you carter good to see you david i hope you're doing well doing well thank you yeah tonight's topic is one of those topics where unfortunately there is a lot of need out in society for the information that we're going to be covering tonight mm -hmm. and it involves divorces it involves child custody, it involves family rights, it involves grandparents' visitation rights, and we're gonna kind of cover the gamut of, of that topic here this evening. And there is a significant need for this information, in particular in Alabama. Recent statistics show that Alabama has about the sixth highest divorce rate throughout the country. So wow. this is something that impacts us greatly here in the uh, Birmingham, Jefferson County and surrounding areas. And I think we're gonna have a lot of useful information for the viewers this evening. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, local attorney Jim Gillis here uh, this evening with us. I won't tell the viewers how long Jim's uh, been practicing exactly, but suffice it to say, he is a very knowledgeable, experienced attorney in the field of divorces, child custody, alimony, visitation rights, all of those particular areas that kind of are fall down below uh, what a divorce can lead to. And so right. Jim, thank you so much for being here with us this evening and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, sure. pleasure to be here. Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your legal background and the nature of your practice right now. Uh, well, I've been practicing almost 30 years now, um, primarily in the Birmingham area and do a lot of litigation, primarily family law, which to me includes uh, divorces, family court, custody, criminal law. Um, I leave the personal injury stuff to the experts, and um, but primarily in domestic relations and family court. Yep. What, what are the, the big things that you see when a, a couple comes in to see you about potentially getting a divorce? Because I don't handle divorce cases at all, but I, I'm familiar enough with it to know that we do get calls from time to time where one, per one person says, my husband and I want to get a divorce and it's uncontested. And my experience kind of from the outside looking in is that once they actually go see a lawyer, a lot of times the uncontested divorce becomes contested pretty quickly. And so has that kind of been your experience in, in this field? Um, I would say it's about 50-50. Typically I won't see both of them together, at least initially. One of them has to be my client and the other one has to be the defendant. But if I reach a point where I'm meeting with both of them, about half the time it's going to break down over something, whether it be the amount of child support to be paid or the, or the custodial rights. But How often would you say are couples uh, getting divorced where it's uncontested, where children are involved? Is that almost taboo? I mean, do you ever have an uncontested divorce typically where children are involved? Um, I would say, I do. And, and I encourage that. Uh, first thing I do with my clients when I'm meeting with them is, is explore, especially when they have kids, is explore if there's any type of, of treatment or counseling or anything they can get to help this as, be as amicable as a divorce can be. When you have children, you know, children are the real people who suffer in this. And, and if you can get them divorced amicably, I think that's the best way to go. But to answer your question, I'd say maybe 50-50. Okay. And as a lawyer, of course, we're also referred to as counselors. Do you perform any type of reconciliation counseling? How much of that is part of your practice or is that something that you try and stay away from? You know, I've got a background in psychology and philosophy, but um, because of the nature of what we do and can only represent one of the parties, if, if I were to be a counselor, then I might 
cut myself out of the case if it if it doesn't settle. So no, I leave that to experts, and there are, there are a number of good counselors out there who can talk to these people if they are talking about some type of either reconciliation or potential to reconciliation or some type of amicable divorce where they can do something that's in the best interest of the kids. Yeah. Now, would I be correct to assume that the two primary issues or factors that you all have to deal with as divorce attorneys always is linked to money and children, if there are children involved? I mean, doesn't everything kind of connect back to those two things? Well, I've never thought about it, but I think, yeah. yes, there, there, are about, there are five primary areas when there are kids involved, and, and, and it all is connected to the children and money. All right. and, and typically, with respect to the children, uh, who's going to have custody and what are the visitation rights? Uh, those would be, I guess, first and foremost topics that you would discuss with them. That's correct. And, and is there a certain default uh, position that we have in Alabama as to which uh, individual is typically going to get the, ch the children, uh, what the visitation rights will be? Do we have a default position at all? We don't. The state doesn't. Um, each jurisdiction, or I'll say even each judge, has what they refer to typically as standard visitation rights. But that's kind of a misnomer because although that's, that's somewhat of a guideline, the judges have the, have the leniency to do whatever they want to do. And there isn't a default position uh, that the court is supposed to, and, and, and they do, look at what's in the best interest of the child. And if the best interest of the child is to be with the father instead of the mother, then I think the courts would order that custody, primary custody, be with the father. So this, this idea that um, I can't get custody of my child because I'm the father, I, I think is wrong. I think generally speaking, the mother is the primary custodian of the child, generally speaking. And, and the courts will look strongly at who has been the primary custodian when they're looking at who should have primary custody of the child. And that's why the mother typically gets it. Now, is there a difference between having physical custody and legal custody? And because I've seen some divorce agreements that will give the mother primary physical custody, but will give the parents joint legal custody. Mm -hmm. And what is the difference there? Sure. Big difference there. Um, you, you've got basically four types of custody. You've got two types of physical custody, uh, joint and sole, and you've got two types of legal custody, joint and sole. Physical custody deals with who has the child or children what periods of time. And you can have joint physical custody and it not be 50-50. So when I say 50-50, each parent has the child 50% of the time. You can split it up differently than that and still call it joint physical custody. Legal custody has to do with the, the things that affect the child. It's like where the child's going to go to college, where the child, uh, you know, what, if the child needs some type of medical procedure. Uh, a lot of times we refer to that as the feel-good provisions because um, I won't say they're meaningless, but if, if you're wanting custody, you want physical custody and not, not legal custody. Right. But although legal custody is important, yeah. it gives you a right to have something to do with their lives. Mm -hmm. Time for us to step aside our first break of the evening. So let me interrupt you guys. We'll be uh, uh, back pick up right here whenever we return as we head to break. A reminder of how you can get in touch with us. Also, you can find the firm of Hollis Wright on both Facebook as well as Twitter. Facebook, just search the term Hollis Wright. Twitter, it's Hollis underscore Wright. Stay tuned. More of the attorneys coming right up. Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright, a personal injury law firm. Thank you for watching The Attorneys. Now we hope you, a friend, or a loved one never needs legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple. Provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free, so if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury related topics, you can call, email, or text us, or you can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter, or simply contact us by going to hollis-right.com and click on the contact us link. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us watching The Attorneys.
Welcome back into the attorneys. Appreciate you being with us tonight talking about family matters. Uh, let's try to pick up uh, where we left off here. Uh, let me ask you about grandparents' rights and, and, and how they, they might have changed. It appears, uh, kind of from a layman's viewpoint, that, that uh, the rights of grandparents have changed. True? Is that accurate? They have changed, and then they haven't changed in some degrees. There, there was a case, a United States Supreme Court case back in 2000, mm -hmm. uh, Troxel v. Granville, that basically said a fit parent has a right to decide if a child should visit with a grandparent or not. Hmm. And um, states have crafted statutes since then trying to comport with that opinion, and unsuccessfully, most of them, they've been struck down as unconstitutional, Alabama being one of them. Just recently, they passed another statute, although it comports more with the Troxel case, it's still very difficult for a grandparent to get visitation rights in their very limited circumstances. Mm -hmm. But it has changed, and, and in my opinion, has changed for the worse in one respect in that um, if it's an intact family, in other words, husband and wife still living together, they have the absolute right to say, uh, you can't see your grandchild. You can, if there's a divorce or if there's a death that, that, that ends the marriage, uh, then you can do something under certain limited circumstances, but you got to prove a lot of things. You got to prove it with clear and convincing evidence that there was a viable relationship between the grandparent and the child, and that's in the best interest of the child. And there are a lot of hoops you got to jump through, but it mm -hmm. has changed. And I think in the situation where a child, a, a, a parent has passed away, then a grandparent has an opening there. Right. But, but otherwise, it's still very difficult based upon that U.S. Supreme Court decision for a grandparent to get visitation with a grandchild. Right. Well, this is a very important topic because we've covered these types of topics before mm -hmm. on the show, David, as you know. And invariably, we seemingly always get a call during the show from a grandparent that is being deprived access to their grandchild in terms of being able to see them and visit with them. And it's just a terrible situation when you think about it. You've got grandparents out there who want to spend time and have uh, access to their grandchildren and help raise them to some extent. And because of a falling out amongst family members, they're being denied access. And it can particularly, I guess, get complicating and challenging when you're going through a divorce proceeding and one spouse doesn't want the uh, in-laws to have access to the child. So it seems like it could be a really difficult situation for all people involved. Yeah, that particular scenario I think opens the door a little bit. What, what troubles me is you might have that spat between a child and the parent. It has no effect on the child, um, um, between the, the parent of the child and his parent, the grandparent. Right has no effect on the child that's involved, but, but because of this spat between the parent and his parents, or her parents, they cut off all the visitation for the grandparent. And there might have been a, a really great bond. Usually grandparents have a good bond with their grandkids. Yeah. But because of this spat, the, grand, the parents say, well, we're just not gonna let you see him anymore. And I just think that's bad. Similar to divorce proceedings where the judge may take into consideration the wishes of the child, and I think that becomes more prevalent the older the child is. Does that also apply in a grandparent situation if you've got a 12, 13, 14 year old grandchild who really wants to have uh, visits and, and be with the grandparents? To, will a judge factor that into the equation at all? I'm sure a judge will, but that goes on into the relationship between the child and the grandparent, which the court definitely will look at. If the, if the child wants to see the grandparent, I think that's gonna have a big effect on the child. Now, how about with respect to child custody, uh, uh, excuse me, child support? Uh, have there been any changes in Alabama's law recently in terms of child support and, and how that is calculated? The, the most important one, and has not been discussed much, uh, is there has been a change in how you figure out the amount of health insurance. In the past, health insurance was figured out by the cost of the family coverage. So you could have four kids from another marriage, you could have your new spouse involved, and it would be the entire amount of that family coverage would be used to calculate. Now, and this, this came out not too long ago, within the last year, I believe. Now you calculate it, you figure out how many people are covered by the insurance, and then you divide that number into the amount of the premium, and then you multiply that number by the number of kids who are affected by this child support order. So it can, in my opinion, can greatly uh, reduce the amount of the child support obligation if, if it fits into that scenario. What happens if a judge enters an order 
uh, signing a certain amount of child support, let's say to the to the father or to the husband, um, and he has a change in circumstances several months or years later in terms of his employment or his income. What should the father do at that point in order to effectuate a change mm -hmm. to the child custody child support payments if he can't pay them anymore? Yeah, um, you can file what's called a petition for modification, and it has to be based upon a material change in circumstances. It has to be at least a 10% change in the amount of child support, either either more, 10% more, or 10% less than what it was previously. Um, if it's a, let's say it's a change in his job and he's making more money, the court's going to look at why he has that change in his income because it's based upon your ability to produce income and not necessarily what you're making. So if you are voluntarily unemployed or underemployed, uh, if you quit a job that you were making more money at or if you were fired from co for cause from a job, court can impute income to you based upon your ability to produce income and not necessarily what you're making. So that the proverbial where the doctor goes out and says, you know, I'll just go flip hamburgers and McDonald's and really get my child support reduced, uh, the court will look at that and potentially impute income to it. Mm. Wow. All right, time for us to take a, a break. We'll pick up again right there whenever we get right back. This is our final break of the evening, so the uh, clock is ticking. Time is uh, wasting away. If you want to join our conversation or speak with an attorney standing by live right now just to speak with you, so take advantage of that. Stay tuned. The final segment of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Tyler Vail with the law firm of Hollis Wright. In court, attorneys are not allowed to tell juries certain things. For example, we cannot talk about a defendant's net worth, meaning the defendant's ability, resources, or insurance to pay a verdict. In this week's Legal 411, we're answering the question, why can't lawyers talk about a defendant's net worth to a jury? Rule 403 of the Alabama Rules of Evidence states, although relevant, Evidence may be excluded if its probative value is substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice, confusion of the issues, or misleading the jury, or by considerations of undue delay, waste of time, or needless presentation of cumulative evidence. Long-standing Alabama cases have held that the net worth of a defendant falls under this catch-all rule. The reasoning behind the rule is that if a jury knows a defendant is wealthy, then the jury might award more money to the plaintiff. And this goes one step further. If an attorney makes any remarks that suggest the defendant is responsible because he is rich and the plaintiff is poor, that can be grounds for a new trial. If you're ever on a jury, the reality in our state is this. In almost every lawsuit that goes to trial, the attorneys representing both the plaintiff and the defendant have already looked at whether there is sufficient insurance coverage or assets to satisfy a verdict. The reality is this. The parties would not pursue a civil lawsuit if damages could not be paid after a jury returns a verdict. So even though lawyers cannot mention the net worth of a defendant during a trial, there could still be resources available to pay a verdict in court. Please remember, your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. I can just hear those phones a buzzing on tonight's topic of conversation. Uh, no need to fret. You got uh, several minutes remaining. Our attorney's standing by to speak with you, the attorneys from Hollis Wright. As we continue on here, uh, a question here. What has changed in terms of parental obligation to pay for a college education? Any changes? Any changes there? That has greatly changed. Uh, a few years ago, it was the Christopher case, um, ex parte Christopher, uh, no, N. Ray Christopher, did away with the obligation for uh, college basically stating that once a child turns 19, there's no obligation to have to take care of that child or pay anything for that child if you don't want to. Now, if you've already got a divorce agreement in place, 
um, that is something that will still be enforced. Uh, you, and you can still reach an agreement to say that you'll agree to pay for college education, but right. after that date, and I forget when it was, it was about two years ago uh, that the Christopher case came out, that um, no more obligation for college. So if that's an important consideration, which you hope it would be to parents that are going through a divorce, your recommendation would be to address that issue with their respective attorneys and iron it out in the divorce agreement so that you have an agreement in place where at least you either know there's an obligation beyond the age of 19 or at least you know there's not one and you can make plans and, uh, and contingencies for that event. I, I would do that if I was negotiating some type of settlement. I would throw that in there because otherwise you're not going to have it. So if you were the spouse who makes the lesser amount of money and you want to be sure your child gets this college education as part of the settlement negotiations, you want to throw in there that the other parent has to pay some amount for college. Now, how does Alabama law handle uh, children that are disabled, have either a physical, emotional, or mental handicap of some kind? Uh, how do they handle that relative to child support? That's what we refer to as a Brewington case, which is the, the name of the case that um, started that. Um, a parent right now still has the obligation to take care of a child if, if the court orders it. It has to be a disability that, that was there before the divorce and, um, and before the child turns 19. Otherwise, the parent may not be obliged to do it. But even that is changing because of the Christopher case, because of the Supreme Court saying that there's no obligation to take care of a child after that child turns 19. Uh, we have concerns that that is going to go on to the Brewington cases now, and you won't have an obligation to support a child with a disability after the age of 19, which frankly I think might be terrible. Mm. Well, let's talk a minute about common law marriage. What is a common law marriage? How does Alabama define it? And has there been any recent changes in the law relative to common law marriages? Uh, absolutely. In fact, there was just in this last legislature, there was a, a change in the statutes. So effective January 1, 2017, uh, common law marriage is abolished in Alabama. There will be no such thing. However, if you were common law married before January 2017 and you want to separate or end that, that marriage, um, you can still be considered married, even though it was a common law marriage, and you have to go and prove all the elements of a common law marriage, which there's no strict test, but you look at the totality of the circumstances. Um, did you live together as husband and wife? Did you hold each other out as husband and wife? Did you introduce each other as, you know, did, did, the, did the woman take on the man's last name or vice versa, I guess? Um, did you file joint tax returns? Was one spouse on the other's insurance? These are all factors that the court will look at to determine if there is a common law marriage. Now, I'll give you one caveat, though. Uh, in fact, I was talking with Julie Palmer, who is the presiding circuit judge about this just today. What do you do if you have a common law marriage and you decide on down the road you want to end that, but you just split up and then you remarry someone else? Is that a new marriage, a valid marriage? And in my opinion, it's not. If you had what was a valid common law marriage, you need to go through a divorce proceeding to terminate that marriage, otherwise you're committing bigamy. And I guess would it be the person that you left, I guess, might challenge the subsequent formal marriage for some reason as to where how that could arise? Well, no, it could actually work to your benefit because it, what, if it's an invalid, if the second marriage is an invalid marriage, then there's no splitting up of assets and things of that nature. So it really depends on what side you're on that. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it can have dramatic effects. Now, now let's talk a little bit about the benefits of common law marriage in terms of uh, maybe like health insurance or retirement benefits and things mm -hmm. like that. What, what is a person eligible for through their common law married spouse? Well, the person who's married to them, I, and I guess that would be up to the individual insurance companies and, and so forth, but if, if they consider you to be a spouse, whether common law or otherwise, then you'd be entitled to all the same benefits as you would be if you were legally, well, it is a legal marriage, as if, if you'd had the marriage itself with a, with a marriage certificate. So in terms of 401k retirement benefits, or, or lawsuits, if, if somebody dies and they have a wrongful death lawsuit or they have a 401k with retirement funds, they're gonna be eligible to, absent a will, I guess, but they're gonna be eligible to receive those types of benefits just as somebody who had a formalized marriage ceremony with a marriage certificate? I believe that's the case, yeah. Okay. 
Um, it, it, you may have a harder time proving it and someone may challenge it because it's a common law marriage. And, and even if the common law marriage ends, there needs to be a divorce settlement? Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Right. Uh, it, it would be as if you were did the ceremonial marriage right. and just separated, yeah. you're still married to that person. Yeah. Uh, we're uh, running short on time, but I wanted to give both of you uh, the opportunity just for a final thought. And Jim, we'll have you go first, please, sir. Uh, my final thought would be there are, there are a lot of changes in, in domestic relations law that's changing all the time, and um, especially that one regarding the insurance that I talked about, mm -hmm. the, the health insurance. I would ad advise you to go see your lawyer, call your lawyer, set up an appointment, and at least recalculate and see if that has a big enough effect on the amount of child support you pay to make it worthwhile to pursue it. Right, right. Yeah, I think it's incredibly important for the attorney and the two individuals that are getting a divorce to understand just how many issues there are that can arise, not only in the short term while you're getting a divorce, but long term. College education, okay, we have a disabled child, what are we gonna do in terms of supporting this disabled child when they reach the age of majority or 19 years old? And so I think it's very important for everybody to be very forward thinking and identify all of the issues that could arise into the future and address those on the front end so that you don't have problems on the back end when they do reach those uh, ages. And so that would be the advice I would have for uh, the viewers. That's good. All right, gentlemen. Well, thanks so much for the time. It just flies by, doesn't it? Yeah, thank you, Dave. We, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, Jim, good to see you again, and thanks for being with us. Oh, it was a pleasure to be here. Hope to, hope to come again sometime. Absolutely. We'll certainly have you back, Carter. Nice job as always, thank you. sir. Hey, uh, I want to thank you as well for being with us tonight. We never take for granted your uh, joining us, so thank you so much for that. And uh, we, we certainly appreciate you being with us each and every Sunday night. As we wrap things up, uh, a reminder of how you can get in touch with the firm of Hollis Wright. If you need to do so, ways for you to call, email, uh, as well as follow them on social media, which is Facebook and Twitter. And don't forget, attorneys are standing by just a few minutes remaining. So if you pick up the phone, call that number, uh, get some great advice, uh, free legal advice from the attorneys at Hollis Wright. Again, thank you so much for the time. We'll look for you next week right here for the attorneys. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright.